Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for today's seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Catherine Whitehead from Carnegie Mellon University. Katie is an associate professor and Dean's career fellow in the departments of chemical engineering and biomedical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Her lab develops drug delivery systems for RNA and proteins and for applications in maternal and infant health. Uh, Dr. Whitehead is the recipient of numerous awards. I'm just going to name a few of them here. She has received the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, the DARPA Director's Fellowship, as well as the Controlled Release Society's Young Investigator Award. Katie is an elected fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and was named as a pioneer on the MIT Technology Review's Innovators Under 35 list and as one of the brilliant 10 by Popular Science. Before I hand it over to Katie, I just want to remind the audience to please keep your questions for the end. You can ask your questions either by typing them through the Q&A option uh, on the Zoom webinar, or you can also raise your hand and directly ask your question. With that, Katie, thank you very much for being here today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Professor Nerui. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, and I'll be sharing some of the work that my lab does in the area of lipid nanoparticles for RNA delivery. And suddenly this has been kind of thrust into the limelight over the past year with the success of the SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccines. And so my goal today is uh, not just to tell you a little bit about our work, but also educate you a bit on what really are the ingredients inside of these nanoparticles. How, do, how did they work as part of these mRNA therapeutics and what does the vaccine actually do to our immune system? <laughs> So let's start at the beginning, um, which has to do with what's shown here is the central dogma of molecular biology. And it tells us that DNA, which is our permanent genetic blueprint, it exists in the nuclei of each of our cells. Uh, this is transcribed in our cells into this temporary copy of those instructions called messenger RNA or RNA. And that then is converted in the cell into proteins. And proteins are the doers in our body. They're responsible for basically all of our functions. And when disease develops, uh, it's because of a problem with protein production. And it might be because there's too much of a protein. It might be because there's too little of a protein or perhaps there's um, a mutated protein. And so if we're going to treat any of these diseases, what we really need to do is to fix protein production. And we can do that in a couple of different ways. Um, one is to directly go after the protein level, which you know, has some challenges. The DNA level, uh, that involves often manipulation of the genome, which uh, can have its own disadvantages. Uh, what's nice here is this intermediate molecule messenger RNA, um, because of its temporary nature, it does offer a nice alternative to DNA delivery and that it, it exists only for a short period of time. And it has a pretty exquisite control over protein production. And so by delivering different types of RNA, we can then ultimately affect that uh, protein production. And so at the beginning of um, the century, it came to light that there's a mechanism inside of our cells called RNA interference, um, pioneered partially at, at MIT. And we can use a molecule called short interfering RNA or siRNA to silence the production of um, certain types of proteins. This siRNA, if it's designed properly, it can bind to an mRNA target and essentially turn it off. And so we can downregulate the expression of certain proteins that we may not want. Um, perhaps more powerfully, we now have the ability to deliver mRNA into our cells. And in this case, we might want to introduce more of an mRNA that our bodies already make, perhaps to augment production or to make the correct version of a mutated protein. But part of the power of mRNA therapy is that it also gives us the ability to ask our bodies to make 
proteins that it's never seen before. And so if we were to introduce an mRNA for a completely new protein, for example, with the vaccines, it would be the spike protein on the coronavirus. We can then have our bodies make that protein. Um, and in this case, mount an immune response. So all in all, because of their ability to control protein production, messenger RNA drugs just have tremendous therapeutic potential, and they can be used in a number of different applications in addition to the vaccines. Um, so perhaps the most obvious form of messenger RNA therapy would be protein replacement therapy when we want more of a particular um, protein within our bodies. Um, and this can be used to treat, there are numerous diseases associated with mutated proteins like cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy. And so this would give us the opportunity to introduce the correct forms of um, the missing or the mutated proteins into our systems. Vaccines are clearly the most clinically advanced form of messenger RNA delivery. They kind of always have been um, back to the year, you know, 2010, 2011. And in addition to the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, there are many other mRNA vaccines in development, uh, notable, notably HIV and influenza vaccines uh, and, and many others. You can also use messenger RNA to do a type of cancer immunotherapy. Uh, so there's a type of immunotherapy called CAR T therapy. And this can be accomplished with messenger RNA by introducing messenger RNA into some of our immune cells. And that messenger RNA will encode um, an antigen that, that is basically specific to a patient's cancer. And it tells the immune cells um, to look out for this antigen, uh, antigenic peptide. And so then those immune cells, when they're unleashed in the body, they have been trained to go and seek out those cancer cells and to destroy them. Another thing that we can do is we can use uh, messenger RNA to help with cellular reprogramming, which can be good for uh, various applications uh, such as tissue engineering. So progenitor cells and stem cells in our bodies, they uh, differentiate in the presence of particular proteins called transcription factors. And so what you can do is if you want to affect the differentiation pathway of these progenitor-like cells, you can introduce messenger RNA encoding for specific trans transcription factors and then help differentiate these uh, stem cells down the right pathway for your application. And now while all of these applications I've shown you here, they involve upregulation of a particular protein, we can also use messenger RNA therapy to downregulate or silence proteins. And we can do that using gene editing technologies. So in this case, we would want to deliver messenger RNA encoding Cas9 or some other nuclease that's capable of cutting our DNA. And in this case, we need to co-deliver with that messenger RNA. We need to also introduce a guide strand that will help direct the nuclease to the correct version um, or to the correct area of our genome. And so really this is very powerful. We can upregulate protein production. We can downregulate protein production. If you wanna learn more about these applications, I'd um, refer you to a review that one of my talented students wrote a few years ago. And so this is, you know, this is fantastic. We have all of this therapeutic potential, but we also have a problem. And it's that messenger RNA, it makes a pretty bad drug. And it has a couple of things wrong with it, so to speak. So first of all, it's a macromolecule. It's quite large on the order of about 100,000 grams per mole. And the size makes it difficult to cross any kind of biological barrier. It's also very negatively charged. So each um, you know, base area essentially carries um, a negative charge. And so as a whole, very negatively charged. And so it doesn't readily cross our cell membranes, which are also somewhat negatively charged. And then finally, it has a very lousy biodistribution properties in vivo. It's quite an unstable molecule. And so if you inject it into the bloodstream, it will be recognized as foreign and it'll be uh, cleared relatively 
quickly by our immune system and also through the kidneys. And so if we want to have these messenger RNA molecules go uh, into the right cells, it, it needs our help. So just to illustrate all of the different barriers that a nanoparticle would need to overcome to take messenger RNA into the right cell, um, we just have this schematic right here. And when I consider all these different barriers, I think it's really pretty amazing that we have anything uh, that overcomes all of them and is, is able to do what we like. So we're gonna have some kind of a nanoparticle here that encapsulates our RNA. And in the case of IV delivery, we would inject that into the bloodstream. In the case of intramuscular delivery, like the vaccines, we would just go directly into the muscle tissue. Uh, if we went intravenously, we're then in the bloodstream. And the first thing our particles need to do is to avoid a process called phagocytosis. And so this is when the immune cells would recognize the nanoparticle as foreign and gobble them up before they could go anywhere. The particles will also then need to get out or cross out of these blood vessels into the specific tissue, uh, sometimes called the extracellular matrix of a tissue, and it will need to diffuse through that matrix to the vicinity of the cell. And then once it's at that target cell, it needs to be uptaken into the cell. And this typically happens through a process called endocytosis. And this is when our nanoparticles bind receptors on the surface of the cell, and the cell then reaches its membrane up and around that nanoparticle, and it brings it inside. But once this particle is inside, it's in this walled off compartment in the cell called an endosome. And typically the cell has an endosome, it brings in things from the outside, it's looking for nutrients or other molecules that it wants. And when it, it, ter when it interrogates uh, this endosome containing the lipid nanoparticle, it does not see something that it wants. And so typically this endosome then is going to acidify and will eventually degrade the nanoparticle unless the nanoparticle has some way um, to accomplish what we call endosomal escape. And so this here, uh, escape from the endosome, is one of the most challenging parts of the delivery process. And it's estimated that even the most world-class delivery materials escape the endosome only about 2 to 3% of the time. And so if we can have this happen, then finally we have our RNA in the cytoplasm of the cell, where in the case of RNA interference, it'll interface with the RNA interference machinery, or in the case of messenger RNA, it can interface with the translational machinery to make those proteins. So a question that we asked years ago um, was whether we could develop a potent and degradable RNA delivery system potent for obvious reasons and degradable because when you're thinking about an RNA therapy, by definition, it's going to be transient. And so while for certain applications, perhaps a vaccine application, you might need only one injection or you might need um, the effect to last only a short period of time, there are many other applications where you'd need uh, repeated injections. And so it, it's absolutely imperative that we have nice degradability in these systems. And so what we make in my lab, we call them lipidoids. A uh, lipidoid uh, just means a lipid-like material. And they were designed to mimic some of the legacy lipids that have been used for decades at this point to deliver different types of nucleic acids. And so this lipid here, for example, is a cationic lipid. It can be used to deliver an assortment of nucleic acids. And, um, you know, over the past decades, it has been used to form nanostructures called liposomes, shown here, where we have this nice lipid bilayer with the hydrophilic portions, this head group of our lipid facing both the exterior and the interior of our part. Uh, particle. And this aqueous core can then be used to deliver other types of hydrophilic materials, including nucleic acids. And so we wanted to make something like this based on lipids, uh, since our cell membranes are made of lipids and it can um, assist in delivery into cells. 
So what we do in terms of this synthesis is use this high throughput reaction chemistry called Michael addition, and we react some kind of alkyl amine. So here we have a primary amine, but you can use a combination of primary and secondary amines. These will react with these alkyl acrylate tails here. And you can just plunk these two ingredients into a scintillation vial, add a stir bar, um, heat, and then wait a couple of days. And out the other side, you will have this product that doesn't look too dissimilar from um, what we have up here in terms of our lipid. Just going to convert here to a laser pointer. So um, then depending on the amines you use, you can have a variety of different numbers of tails. So up here you have two tails, down here I've drawn something with four tails. And in terms of degradability, that comes through using these, um, by using an acrylate material, we have esters in the final product. And these will degrade under physiological conditions. And in general, these materials are really great at encapsulating and forming nanoparticles with RNA because of electrostatic interactions. So particles are often formulated at uh, somewhat acidic conditions. And so under those conditions, our amines in the lipidoid, they will become at least partially protonated. And so then there's this really nice electrostatic interaction that helps catalyze the formation of these nanoparticles. And the way they are made is a fairly straightforward process. So you're going to have uh, two solutions. One is going to be your RNA in what is essentially a saline solution. And then you have another solution of uh, all the different types of lipids, which I'll describe in a moment. And those are dissolved in ethanol. And you need to use some kind of technique uh, by which you rapidly combine these two streams uh, with enough agitation that we get this nanoparticle formation. So uh, there are a variety of techniques using microfluidic devices, uh, different types of you know, geometry for the microfluidic devices. And um, my lab has a microfluidic device. We don't get super reproducible data uh, with our microfluidic devices, unfortunately. And so we just use the, the tried and true method of, uh, for ourselves of pipetting. So we just pipette two solutions into a microcentrifuge tube and then vortex liberally. And out the other side of this process, will come these solid lipid nanoparticles. So they're not really the liposomes I described before with an aqueous core. Uh, they have the RNA and different types of lipids packed throughout this particle. And so, um, you know, as by way of ingredients, we have these ionizable lipidoids that I described before. And these are one of the non-natural ingredients in these particles. And researchers around the world have screened, made and screened, you know, hundreds of thousands of these types of materials to look for ones that work well. And because of that, this tends to be where a lot of the intellectual property is in the RNA delivery space. In addition to that ionizable lipid, there's a fair amount of cholesterol in these particles, which adds stability uh, to the particles, just the same way it does in our cell membranes, which also have a lot of cholesterol in them. We would all be piles of goo if it were not for the cholesterol in our bodies. There are also helper lipids in these particles. So these are phospholipids, often naturally occurring in our cell membranes as well. So for the particles that we use in my lab, uh, we use a helper lipid called DOPE. Uh, there are other um, types of ionizable lipids that go better with one called DSPC. There's also a PEG lipid. So PEG is polyethylene glycol. It's a hydrophilic polymer that can help disguise these particles from the immune system. And it's present here on the exterior of the cells or excuse me, the nanoparticles, it also helps to stabilize these nanoparticles. The lipid part essentially serves as an anchor and it can wedge itself into the hydrophobic uh, lipid portion here. 
So over the years, my lab has screened uh, thousands of different ionizable lipids for different types of RNA delivery. We began with siRNA delivery, and we've tried then to learn, um, uh, or I should say here, here is how we do these uh, libraries. We do what's called combinatorial chemistry, in which we take each one of these tails and we react it with each amine. And so five times 280 is going to be 1400 different materials in this case. And so we have found a number of materials that worked really well for siRNA delivery. Um, we've had a fair amount of success both with in vivo targets and ex vivo and in vitro targets. And, um, you know, then, then the time came where we wanted to ask, what about messenger RNA delivery? So it was about maybe 2014, 2015, when messenger RNA got to the point where it was commercially available and we could purchase some inside my lab to try this out. So it wasn't clear how many of the lessons from siRNA delivery would then translate over um, to messenger RNA delivery. And that's in part because, um, yes, they're made up of the same building blocks, right? They're made up of nucleic acids. And so you would think there are going to be some similarities uh, across the delivery methods, and there are. Um, but there's also significant differences in how uh, they, they appear molecularly. So siRNA is a relatively small RNA molecule. It is 21 bases on either side. It's about 13,000 grams per mole. And it essentially behaves like a short, stiff rod. It's relatively stable because of those base pairs. That is compared to messenger RNA, which is you know, quite cumbersome in comparison. It's single-stranded, so it's far less stable. And you can see it has a fair amount of both secondary and tertiary structure. And so when you're thinking about incorporating these two molecules into a nanoparticle, you know, this messenger RNA is going to be more difficult to condense into that particle than would be an siRNA. And once these materials are inside the particle, you're gonna have uh, different types of packing of those different lipids that are going to occur. So again, it wasn't clear to us necessarily the design rules, um, the chemistry rules that we had learned about siRNA delivery, how much they would apply to messenger RNA delivery. And so when we began some of this work, we wanted to look at uh, a small library of these lipidoid materials and see what we could learn about structure function at a small scale. And so for these experiments, we worked with an amine that we call 306 nominally, and it was our best performer from siRNA delivery work. And so all of the uh, materials I'll show you here have this amine, and we reacted that with 11 different tails to form lipidoids. So here are the 11 different tails that we looked at. Uh, they vary in the number of carbons incorporated into their tails. And you can see here, they range from six carbons in length, excuse me, up to 18 carbons in length. And all of them are straight chains with the exception of this tail right here, um, which has this branch. So we assessed their efficacy in mice using something called IVIS imaging. And what we would do here is we would formulate our nanoparticles with messenger RNA that encodes the protein firefly luciferase. Um, so firefly luciferase is, is certainly not native to mice or to people, but it's a really nice uh, reporter protein that we can visualize to see how well our messenger RNA delivery worked. So we take these nanoparticles and we inject them into the tail vein of B6 mice. And then a few hours later, we take these mice and we put them on an animal imaging system to quantify the amount of luciferase that we see in these animals. So here I'm going to show you images and then quantitative data of those results. 
This here is uh, a panel for what we call naked mRNA. It just means that a plain old mRNA without a delivery vehicle is, in, um, is delivered into these animals. And the organs we're looking at here are the pancreas, spleen, kidneys, liver, heart, and lungs. And everything's gray here. It means we don't see any signal, there's no delivery. But then when we incorporate this messenger RNA into our different nanoparticles, we do see some delivery taking place in most cases. So in general, we saw that the shorter tail lengths and the longer tail lengths, they were not working particularly well. However, there seemed to be the sweet spot around 10 carbon uh, length chains where we were seeing nice delivery. And so if we look at the quantified data over three or four mice here, we can see again what I was saying, very minimal delivery at lower and higher carbon chain lengths. And then these 10 carbon tails are doing quite well. Um, and delivery in those, with those nanoparticles is mostly to the liver and the spleen. Now, what's super interesting here is note this broken axis here. So these two different materials, this one here, it gives us an order of magnitude um, and then some better delivery than the other. But what's so fascinating from a chemistry standpoint is when we look at the differences in the chemical structure of these ionizable lipids. So they both have these 10 carbon chains. They both have the same molecular weight, the same chemical formula. The only difference is that we've taken a single carbon and we've moved it a single position. And this is just one molecule. This ionizable lipid is just one molecule out of five molecules that go into one of these nanoparticles. And it works more than an order of magnitude better. It just goes to show you how exquisite chemistry is and how really tiny differences in the chemistry within these lipid nanoparticles, um, you know, how much it matters and how big of a difference it makes. So I'll speak a little bit as to what we think might be happening here. Um, I don't think we have all the answers at this point. So one of the things my lab is interested in is trying to have our understanding of structure function relationships get to the point where we can better predict in vivo efficacy. Um, screening a lot of materials in vitro uh, in cell culture, it often does not translate very well into the animals. It would be much nicer if we could just write down a structure and we would know how well it would work in the animal. And so towards that goal, um, we have attempted to correlate quite a number of parameters with how these materials are delivering mRNA in animals. And in each of the graphs I'll show you here, we're going to have this in vivo efficacy, uh, that's the efficacy in animals on the y-axis. These all are the same y-axis I showed you before where we've delivered firefly messenger RNA for firefly luciferase here. And then we have uh, different variables on our x-axis. So here is if we look at that cell culture efficacy, um, and as I, as I said, we have an R squared value of 0.3 here. So pretty poor correlation, all things considered between cell culture and animal experiments. We can look at lipid nanoparticle diameter after we've made these different formulations and we don't see any trends when it comes to diameter. We don't really see any trends when it comes to the amount of the mRNA that we add to our solution, how much of that actually is incorporated into the particle. I think it's safe to say that high entrapment is a necessary but insufficient condition for quality animal delivery. And then another parameter that's been reported on in the past as being important for um, messenger RNA and siRNA delivery is a value called the PKA. And the PKA for a particular lipid nanoparticle tells us the pH at which these um, particles become half charged, at which their surface becomes half protonated uh, compared to the maximum possible. 
And when we compare PKA versus our in vivo efficacy, um, we don't really see any trends, although we do see some of our better particles have, you know, PKAs below seven, which is consistent with the literature. But one thing we wondered is whether or not it was just the PKA, so the pH at which these materials were becoming protonated, but would it matter how protonated they were becoming? Would a stronger charge at a particular pH uh, be more beneficial than not? And so um, there are a couple of different pHs that are relevant to the RNA delivery process. Uh, if you think back to that slide of the barriers that I showed you before. So when these particles are in the bloodstream and outside of our cells, they're at neutral pH, right? They're in the bloodstream. And so generally we want them to be neutrally charged under, under those conditions because a positive charge sometimes confers uh, some toxicity to these particles. Then once they are inside the cell, they're in this endosome, which acidifies. And it has been shown before that when particles are able to do this endosomal escape step, it often happens when that endosome has a pH of about five. Okay, so that's also a very important pH to consider in this delivery process. So what's pretty cool here is that when we look at our in vivo efficacy compared to our ionization, um, that total amount of charge that these materials have at neutral pH, we don't really see any trends here. But when we look at ionization at that critical pH of five, um, we see a really nice correlation between that ionization and our in vivo efficacy. So, you know, we then followed up with a relatively, um, excuse me here, I just wanted to point out that this may help explain the differences between this excellent delivery material that I mentioned before and the good delivery material. And so somehow this excellent delivery material is giving us far better ionization than the good delivery material. And the question is, why would that be happening? And I don't think we have a good answer beyond saying that, you know, perhaps there's something about this isodecyl group here that acts almost like a wedge within the nanoparticle, and it might help push um, adjacent or neighboring amines in these lipidoids away from each other a little bit, um, and in, in having less electrostatic repulsion, it may give the opportunity for these amines to take on a little bit of extra charge. So that's our best guess. Uh, we don't really have any way of proving that. So just to see if this effect would hold beyond that small library that I told you about before, um, we took three other amine groups and we reacted each of those with those same 11 tails. And so that gave us a library of about 33 materials. And when we looked at their ionization, we did see similar trends. Uh, we saw that materials with very low ionization were giving us low efficacy in our animals and materials with high ionization were giving us high amounts of efficacy. And so while the correlation isn't perfect, it certainly has given us, um, you know, much better guidance on what's going to happen with our animals. And what's beautiful about it is, is it, it doesn't require any kind of cell culture. This ionization measurement is something that you can complete, you know, over a half hour experiment. So through this process, we did identify this really interesting material. We nominally call it 306-OI10. Here's what it looks like with this 306 amine group and then these four different isodecyl branches here. And again, these esters, which will confer degradability. And we wanted to see really how well this nanoparticle compared to some of the industry standards that are out there. So again, I'm showing you some firefly luciferase efficacy data when we're looking at these different organs. Uh, our negative control, again, doesn't show any signal. 
here is our favorite delivery material giving us this beautiful signal in the liver and some signal as well in the spleen. MC3 is an industry standard. It is contained in the first FDA approved lipid nanoparticle formulation, um, one of Al Nylum's products for siRNA delivery. It was approved back in to, uh, 2018. And so we can do about threefold better than that. And C12200 is a very well characterized ionizable lipid in the literature. And so we also wanted to compare to that. And we had about tenfold better efficacy um, of the C compared to the C12200. We also wanted to look at relative um, you know, toxicity between these different particles. And so we assessed that in a number of ways, one of which was uh, by histology of the liver to check for any abnormalities. So up here, we have our saline control. Um, all three of the animals compared similarly with our favorite material here. And then um, we did have some immune filtration which are these dark, dark spots here. One of the three samples or one of the three mice of MC3 and two of the three mice with C12200. So, you know, certainly more extensive toxicity and immunogenicity testing would need to be done. Um, but we do seem to, you know, compare favorably at this point. One of the things that I personally live in fear of is identifying a really potent lipid nanoparticle material, um, but only being able to use it once. And that's because there are certain ionizable lipids that when you introduce them into the body, um, for whatever reason, the immune system recognizes them as foreign and will mount an antibody response against them. And so while they'll work that first time, if you introduce them again, which is um, fairly common if you're doing messenger RNA delivery, then they won't work. Okay, so that's not great. So uh, fortunately, that's not the case with our new favorite material here. Here we're looking at the kinetics of the firefly luciferase expression over a period of several days. And so you can see when we give a first dose of this material, we peak in expression around um, six to 12 hours say, and then that expression comes down over a period of the next several days. Our second dose, we come back, we came back a month later for the second dose. It would have given the immune system enough time to have formed um, anti-lipidoid antibodies at that point. Um, and we see that we have nearly identical expression kinetics. And so that was a good thing. We also wanted to show that this lipid nanoparticle was potent enough, not just to deliver a single messenger RNA transcript, but to deliver multiple at once, because there are certainly plenty of uh, diseases where you would need to adjust the protein expression of more than one protein. So in this experiment, we looked at a couple of reporter proteins. So luciferase, as I had described before, um, the mice all have delivery in the spleen and liver, as we saw before. We also delivered messenger RNA for a reporter protein. It's a fluorescent protein called M-cherry. Uh, these are the same mice as I have over here, uh, imaged at the same time. And you can see that there's signal in the liver here. Um, messenger RNA quality can vary, and we've seen that this M-cherry messenger RNA just isn't as high quality as the luciferase, and so that we believe is the reason why um, the signal isn't quite as great here. And then finally, we delivered a messenger RNA in this cocktail for um, a protein that's secreted into the bloodstream. It's called erythropoietin. It's implicated in anemia um, as well as in a couple of other diseases. And what we see here is that our untreated sample, we don't have any expression of or very minimal expression of EPO in these mice. And then we have a significant increase. And I apologize, I don't have my, um, my statistics here, but it is a statistically significant increase in our EPO expression. So nice demonstration, we can do multi-pronged messenger RNA delivery here. 
And um, we're also able to gene edit, which is nice. Um, this is interesting because it requires the co-delivery of both short and long RNA. And so you think about siRNA, which I had described before, this is a total of 42 uh, nucleic acids in length. And sgRNA, it tends to be a little bit larger, usually closer to 100, and it has a slightly different shape. Um, but compared to messenger RNA, these are relatively small RNA molecules. And, um, you know, so to think about, is it possible to have a formulation that's going to incorporate, um, properly incorporate both this large type of RNA and a smaller type of RNA? So our lead nanoparticle, we found that it can edit the liver. Here we used a pretty challenging um, editing model. The mice are called AI9 mice, and they've been genetically altered to have this um, LOXP stop LOXP cassette. I'm not a biology person, um, but what you need to know is that if we properly gene edit, we're going to come in here, we're gonna cut this LOXP site we're gonna cut this LOXP site. We're going to remove what's considered the stop cassette here. And once that stop is gone, we're going to have expression of this TD tomato, which is a fluorescent protein. Okay, so if we've done editing properly, we're going to get color. And that's indeed what we see here. Um, and we see it in the liver. So we're pretty excited about um, this lead nanoparticle. I just wanna summarize this uh, data that I've shown you in my lab before briefly touching upon how, um, you know, how this introductory material applies to our vaccines. So uh, we've identified this unusually potent delivery material. Um, it delivers particularly well to the liver. We've seen that very small changes in lipid nanoparticle chemistry can really make a huge difference in delivery uh, ability of these vehicles. We have seen that the surface ionization of these particles at that pH of five, which is really important in the endosomal escape process. We've seen that this helps us predict efficacy in mice. And then we've also seen that this lead material, it is potent enough to achieve co-delivery of different mRNAs um, as well as gene edit. And so how then um, is this related to our mRNA vaccines for COVID-19? So I think most of you at this point are familiar with the concept of the coronavirus and the spike proteins that are on its surface. Uh, they bind a receptor on our lung epithelial cells called ACE2. And because this is the part of the virus that's kind of exposed to our system, it would make sense to train our immune system to recognize this thing that's on the surface. And over the years um, we've had, and you and I have received vaccines that come in various formats. We have inactivated viruses, we have subunit vaccines, which are small portions of antigenic um, proteins from the pathogen. We can use viral vectors, and now we have these uh, non-viral lipid nanoparticle mRNA options. And what's pretty cool is that most lipid nanoparticles that are out there are very similar, uh, used in different academic labs and used in industry for a variety of applications. And when we look at the two mRNA vaccines um, from BioNTech, Pfizer, and Moderna, they're almost exactly the same. They both contain an ionizable lipid, not a lipidoid, but a lipid. Uh, they contain the same proportion of cholesterol, a helper lipid called DSPE, and um, a PEG lipid where the PEG has a 2000 molecular weight. And so let's look at the only significant difference between these two lipid nanoparticles. So here's our BioNTech Pfizer lipid. You can see here that we have this tertiary amine, um, which conveys a lot of the efficacy in these particles is responsible for that um, charge that's taken on. 
there's an alcohol group here. Then we have esters for degradability. And then I, uh, my lab was absolutely delighted to see these structures come out because they do contain branch tails. And here we have um, a total of four branches that come off. Then if we look at Moderna's lipid, it is not dissimilar. Okay, here we just have a slightly shorter distance between our, um, our alcohol and our nitrogen group. We still have two esters and now we have a single branch down here. So three tails instead of four. Um, you know, and it's reassuring, I think, when two completely different uh, pharmaceutical entities, they have uh, pretty similar results at the end of the day. And so I think it gives us faith that we really do have vehicles here that are working well. And so then finally, my last slide, uh, how are these actually working to generate immunity? Now, I present this slide uh, with full disclosure that I am not an immunologist. I have been told by my immunologist friends that it a little bit simplifies the process. However, um, I can understand it, and so hopefully you can too. So we have these lipid nanoparticles. They approach the cell that's going to be vaccinated. They do their delivery business. And so then we have our messenger RNA encoding the spike protein inside of our cells, uh, and that is then translated into the protein. And the protein can be displayed to the outside of the cell in a couple of different ways, um, but basically the cell knows that this is something foreign. It holds it out outside the cell and it says, hey, immune cell friends, can you come over and check out the spike protein that's on my surface? And when they do come over and check it out, you know, they have a problem with what they see. So there's going to be some kind of B cell in your body with an antibody on its surface that is specific for the spike protein. And at that point, this B cell is going to begin to uh, proliferate eventually into plasma cells. And you're going to have antibodies that are generated against this specific um, spike protein target. And so then in the event that virus ever enters our system, these antibodies will be there um, or the memory will be there so that we can rapidly generate these antibodies and they will bind to the surface of the virus, essentially walling it off from our system, neutralizing it, and then our immune system can escort it out. Then on the other hand, these B cells can also basically pass a message along to our helper T cells, uh, antigen presenting cells, which can separately interface with the surface of our vaccinated cell. And the goal is basically then to inform our cytotoxic T cells, hey, we have this antigen that you should look out for um, from this spike protein. So in the event one of our cells becomes infected, it will display a little bit of that spike protein on um, its surface through a receptor here, uh, the cytotoxic T cell will recognize it, it will know that the cell is infected, and it will then kill it. Okay, so the immune system is really exquisite, it has this backup system by which if the virus enters our bodies, we will have that antibody response and hopefully clear all of the virus from our system. If we can't clear all the virus and some of it infects our cells, we then have this backup mechanism by which those cells will be killed. Um, and so even if all of it doesn't work perfectly, it's going to go a long way uh, to reducing the severity of the infection and preventing some of the hospitalizations we see in unvaccinated patients. So with that, I'd like to thank my lab members who were responsible for the work that you saw today, um, our funding, and you, of course, for your time and attention. I'd point you if you'd like some more information on the ingredients in these particles. I recently gave a TED talk you can find um, with the search term fat balls. It's intended for a completely lay audience if you think it would be helpful to share with your family and friends. And if you're on Twitter, you can also find me there. So thanks again for the invitation and I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Katie, for a great talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions, but before we get to the questions, just uh, a short announcement. Professor Whitehead is going to be available after the seminar uh, for uh, a discussion through the Zoom link that's posted um, in uh, the Zoom webinar chat box. Uh, okay, so now we have time for a few questions, and I already have received some. So let me try to... Okay. 
So you indicated that it appears the microfluidic influence, the microfluidic approach influences reproducibility. What appears to be the limitation of using the microfluidic device for mixing RNA and lipids? It's hard to say really what, um, what the challenge is. So we have a device that's available from, you know, from a particular company. What I can say is that, you know, these, these vaccines are being manufactured using microfluidic systems. Clearly they've been able to figure out how to make reproducible nanoparticles in that way. It's just not clear that the bench scale systems are able to, you know, recapitulate that success. And I know it's not just my lab that has some of these uh, troubles with the commercially available systems. What I can say is that when we make the particles in this microfluidic this bench top mixer that we have, um, we will obtain particles that if we make them on one day versus the other, we'll inject them and they'll actually go to different organs. You know, one day they might go to the liver and lung, the next day they'll go to some liver and spleen. Um, and that'll be under the same mixing conditions, the same flow rates, the same um, ratio of those two streams. And so um, you know, relatively bizarre behavior in my opinion. And so, you know, so we've been leery to push a whole lot on that given how expensive mRNA is to actually incorporate in these particles at the lab scale, we've just been going with what works. Great. So the next question is asking, why is liver your target organ? It's not necessarily the target organ. Um, we have since found that this particular delivery vehicle can be adapted by changing lipid nanoparticle conditions or the, the exact chemistry in the delivery route. Excuse me, it's great at delivering to a variety of different targets. Um, you know, for example, we've seen some pancreas delivery with this material. Um, we're recently working on um, some applications that cross the blood brain barrier and liver is, is one of the easiest places to deliver to indeed with, with nucleic acids. Um, there are plenty of diseases that are in the liver, but I think one of the most um, pressing goals in the RNA delivery field is to figure out how to get particles away from the liver and meet a lot of these um, you know, these needs for diseases outside the liver. Great. Are there elements of molecular design patentable chemistry that allow differentiation or competitive advantage among companies that make lipid nanoparticles at scale? Is there something about organ selectivity that can make one approach superior to another? I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. Um, can you read the question part at the end again? So are there elements of molecular design that uh, allow, that differentiates between different approaches that are used by different companies? I think that's what the question is asking. And is there something about uh, organ selectivity that can make one approach superior to another? Well, what I can say is, you know, the companies aren't always forthcoming with everything they do to formulate their lipid nanoparticles. Uh, certainly just those small differences in the ionizable lipid chemistry between the BioNTech and Moderna lipids, you know, it can certainly influence the surface chemistry of the nanoparticle. And that surface is what is interacting with our systems. And so in the past several years, the field has learned a lot more about how when these particles are injected into our systems, they're coated with a what's called a protein corona. Um, it's difficult to study on soft materials like lipid nanoparticles, but as people are making headway in this area, it's becoming apparent that the proteins that absorb to different lipid nanoparticle surface chemistries can in part dictate where they go inside the body and which cells they're uptaken into. And so I think uh, further understanding, more understanding of how chemistry is then changing the protein corona, which then affects um, organ distribution is, is super important. You demonstrated correlations of particle features within vivo activity in mice. Are results in mice reliably predictive of results in humans? Not necessarily, um, you know, but it's one of those things where you need to start somewhere. Uh, and most things that are going to work 
in higher order animal models or in primates, they will have worked in mice. Um, you know, you would typically go to rats next. Rats are typically a better predictor of toxicity um, when you go to humans than mice are. And so, you know, then you would see does something work well in rats, both in terms of efficacy and some of these toxicological parameters. And then you might move up, for example, to primates. Um, you know, I think that there's less of an issue with translation from mice to rats, for example, than there is going from cell culture to the mouse in the first place. Very, very different systems. Great. Are there studies on how the length of the peg chain may affect efficacy in these particular lipidoid systems? I know that we've done some work in my own lab. Um, I would imagine that something has been published on the topic. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, it really depends on the type of delivery that you'd like to have. So one thing I can say is that there's been work showing that that anchor, the lipid anchor on the pegs, um, that's kind of what inserts itself into the particle. And so the longer that lipid anchor, um, the better essentially the anchor is and the longer the peg will then persist on the particle as it's circulating and experiencing different uh, shear stresses. So if you want a longer circulating particle, you use a longer anchor because when that peg is on there, it tends to circulate longer. So that's one thing that can be said. Um, you know, as far as molecular weights of peg go, I think generally if you want immediate delivery, a peg of 2000 molecular weight is, you know, kind of your sweet spot. You don't completely kill activity though, if you go up to say um, 5,000 or, you know, 350. Um, Great, maybe one last question and we'll move to the other Zoom uh, link. Microfluidic or pipette techniques are not readily scalable. What process equipment can be used to reliably form lipid nanoparticles at commercial scale? That's a good question for people in industry. Great. So uh, with that, thank you again, uh, Dr. Whitehead, very, very much for your time and a very interesting talk uh, for our audience. Thank you for your time. And you can join us uh, through the other Zoom link for further discussion if you're interested. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.